In my mind, ray casting is a lightweight and performant way to reach out into a scene and see what objects are in a given direction. You can think of this as something like a long stick used to poke and prod around a scene. When something is found, we can get all kinds of information about that object and have access to all the components and code on that object. So yeah, it's pretty useful and a tool you should have in your game development toolbox. Before we get too deep in this video, there's a few bits and pieces you should know. Examples here are all going to be in 3D. If you're working on a 2D project, the ideas and concepts are nearly identical, with the biggest difference being that the code implementation is just a tad bit different. It's also worth noting that the code for all the ray casting in the following examples, with the exception of the last example, which is jumping, can be put on any object in the scene, whether that is the player or maybe some form of manager. Functionally, it doesn't matter. The final and really important tidbit is that ray casting is part of the physics engine. This means for ray casting to hit or find an object, that object needs to have a collider or trigger on it. I can't tell you how many hours I've spent trying to debug ray casting, only to find that I forgot to put a collider on an object. Before we get into the examples, we need to take a look at the raycast function itself. The function has a ton of overloads, which can be pretty confusing when you're first getting started. That said, the function basically breaks down into five pieces of information, the first two of which are required for all versions of the function. Those pieces of information are the start position, the direction to send the ray, a raycast hit, which contains all the information about the object that was hit, how far to send the ray, and lastly, which layers can be hit by the raycast. Now, that's a lot, but it's not too bad, and hopefully all of those make sense. Now, Unity does allow us to simplify the input parameters just a bit with the use of a ray. A ray essentially stores the start position and direction in one container, allowing us to reduce the number of input parameters for the raycast function by one. Also notice here that we are defining the raycast hit in line with the use of the keyword out. This effectively creates a local variable just with fewer lines of code. Raycasting is commonly used with shooting mechanics in games, so let's apply this to first person shooting. To do that, we need a ray that starts at the camera, i.e. that's where the player's eyes are, and goes in the camera's forward direction, and that'll go right through the middle of our screen. Then since the raycast function returns a boolean, true if it hits something, false if it didn't, we can wrap the raycast in an if statement. This allows us to run code if an object was hit, or with the use of an else, you could run code if nothing was hit. In the case of first person shooting, we could forgo the distance parameter and let our bullets shoot out to infinity, but I'm gonna set mine to something reasonable like 100. I will however skip the layer mask parameter as I want to be able to shoot everything in the scene so the layer mask isn't really needed. When the ray cast does hit something, I want the player to get some feedback, so I'm going to instantiate a prefab at that hit point. In my case, the prefab has a particle system, a light, and an audio source, just to make shooting a bit more fun. Okay, so that's all working, but what if we want to do something different when we hit a particular type of target? There are of course several ways to do this. The way I chose was to add a script to the target, in this case the purple spheres, that has a public get shot function. This function takes in the direction from the ray, and then applies a force in that direction, plus a little upward force to add some extra juice. Then back in the raycast function, we can check if the object we hit has that target component on it. If it does, we can call the getShot function and pass in the direction of the ray. And of course, this is just an example. This function could be on a player or NPC script and do damage or any other number of things needed for your game. The raycast hit, which we'll talk more about towards the end of the video, gives us access to the object hit and thus all the components on the object so we can do just about anything we need. But we're not quite done yet. We still need some way to trigger this raycast, and we can do that by wrapping it in another if statement that checks if the left mouse button was pressed. And finally, all of that can go into an update function so we check every frame. Now this isn't exactly a AAA first person shooter, but it is functional and a good example of raycasting. Another common task in games is to click on objects with a mouse and have the object react in some way. As a simple example, we can click on an object to change its color, and then have it go back to its original color when we let go of the mouse button. To do this, we'll need two extra variables to hold references to a mesh render, as well as the color of the material on that mesh render. For this example, I am going to make use of a layer mask. I've created a new layer called selectable and changed the layer of all the cubes and spheres in the scene, and left the rest of the objects on the default layer. This will prevent us from clicking on the background and changing its color. 
Then in the script, I created a serialized private field of the type layer mask. The value of this can be set in Unity in the inspector, and we want to set it to the selectable layer. Then if and else if statements, check for the left mouse button being pressed and released respectively. If the button is pressed, we'll need to ray cast. And in this case, we need to create a ray from the camera to the mouse position. And thankfully, Unity has given us a nice built-in function that does exactly that. It's camera.screenpoint to ray, and we need to input the mouse position. With our ray created, we can add our raycast function using the created ray, a raycast hit, a reasonable distance, and our layer mask. If we then hit an object on our selectable layer, we can cache the mesh render and the color of the first material. The caching is so when we release the mouse button, we can restore the color to the correct material on the correct mesh render. Notice that I've also added the function debug.drawLine. When getting started with ray casting, it is super easy to get rays going in the wrong direction or maybe not going far enough. And the draw line function does just as it says, drawing a line from one point to another, which makes it much easier to debug and figure out where our rays are going. There's also a duration parameter, which is how long the line is drawn in the scene view, which can be particularly helpful when ray casting is only done one frame at a time and you want that line to stay on the screen for longer than that frame. So let's move on to a third example, which is moving objects around a scene. Now, at first glance, moving objects seems very similar to selecting objects. Just raycast the object and move the object to the hit point. And I've tried that, I've tried that quite a bit. The problem is the object comes screaming towards the camera because the hit point is closer to the camera than the object's center. And that's probably not what you or your players want to have happen. So one way around this is to use one raycast to select the object and a second raycast to move that object. Each raycast will use a different layer mask to avoid this so-called flying cube problem. To make use of both layer masks, I've added a ground layer to the project and assigned it to the plane in the scene. The selectable layer is assigned to all the cubes and spheres, just like it was in the last example. The values for the layer masks can again be set in the inspector. And to make this all work, we're going to need variables to keep track of the selected object and the last point hit by the raycast. To get our selected object, we'll first check if the left mouse button has been clicked and if the selected object is currently null. If both are true, we use a raycast just like the last example, but in this case, we'll store a reference to the transform of the object that we clicked on. Our second raycast happens when the left mouse button is held down and the selected object is not null. And just like the first raycast, this one goes from the camera to the mouse, but makes use of the second layer mask, which allows the ray to go through the selected object and hit the ground. We can now move the selected object to the point hit by the raycast, and plus, just for a little bit of extra fun, we can move it up as well, which gives the illusion of actually having picked the object up. If we left the code like this and let go of the mouse button, the object would stay levitated above the ground. So instead, when the mouse button comes up, we can set the position to the last point hit by the raycast, as well as setting the selected object variable to null, allowing us to select a new object. The last example I want to take a look at is jumping, which can be easily extended to other platforming needs like detecting a wall in front of the player or being on a slope or maybe the edge of a platform. I'd strongly recommend checking out Sebastian Legg's series on creating a 2D platformer if you want to see raycasting put to serious use, not to mention a pretty good controller for a 2D game. For this example, I've created a variable to store the rigid body and I've cached a reference to that rigid body in the start function. Now, for basic jumping, the player generally needs to be on the ground in order to jump. And yes, you could use a trigger combined with on trigger enter and on trigger exit to track if the player is touching the ground, but that's clumsy and has definite limitations. Instead, we can use a short raycast directly down from the player object to check and see if we're near the ground. Once again, this makes use of a layer mask and in this case, only casts to the ground layer. To make it reusable and a little bit tidier, I've wrapped the raycast into a separate function that returns the boolean from the raycast. The raycast distance is set to 1.1 since a player object, in this case a capsule, is 2 meters high and I want the raycast to extend just beyond the object. If the raycast extends too far, the ground can be detected when the player is off the ground and the player will be able to jump while in the air. I find setting up raycasting in situations like this can be a little tricky, so I've once again added in the debug.drawLine function to be able to double check that the ray is in the correct place and reaching outside of the player object. Then in the update function, we check if the spacebar is pressed along with whether the player is on the ground. 
If both are true, we apply a force to the ridge body and the player jumps. In all four of the raycasting examples, the real star of the show is the raycast hit variable. It's how we get a handle on the object the raycast found, and there's a decent amount of information that it can give us. In the, all the earlier examples, we made use of point to get the exact coordinates of the hit. And for me, this is what I'm using nine times out of 10, or even more when I'm raycasting. We can also access the normal vector of the surface we hit, which among other things could be useful if you want something to ricochet off a surface, or if you want to have a placed object sit flat on a surface. The raycast hit can also return the distance from the ray's origin to the hit point, and if there happens to be a rigid body on that object, we can get a reference to it as well. If you want or need to get really fancy, you can also access bits about the geometry and textures at that particular hit point. There are some additional bits and pieces to raycasting that I think are worth knowing that didn't fit into my examples. If you don't set a distance for a raycast, Unity will default to an infinite distance. Now, for examples like the shooting, it doesn't matter if the bullets go to infinity, but for the jump, it very much does. In some circles, raycasting can get a bad rap for performance, but the truth is it's pretty lightweight. So to convince myself and to demonstrate at least a little bit to you guys, I created a simple example that raycasts between one and a thousand times per frame. Now in an empty scene on my computer with one raycast per frame, I saw over 5,000 frames per second. With a thousand raycasts per frame, that dropped down to 800 frames per second. But more importantly, and admittedly no more precisely measured, the main thread only took a one millisecond hit when going from one raycast to a thousand raycasts per frame. Now, while that isn't insignificant, it's also not game breaking. So if you're doing 10, 20, or maybe even 100 raycasts per frame, probably not something that you need to worry about unless you're trying to create the next esports title. So there you go, four common uses of raycasting in games. I hope that was interesting and better yet, useful for you and your project. And until next time, happy game designing.